Very good. So while uh, Melanie walks on the stage, uh, I'd like to introduce her. Uh, Melanie uh, is the CEO of Radically Open Security. Radically Open Security is, is, a, is a Dutch uh, penetration testing company, but unlike probably Swiss penetration company, they are not for profit. Uh, penetration testing company. So with the profits they're making, the revenue they're getting, they're investing this in, uh, in charities, furthering the cause of digital rights and internet security research for the benefit of everybody. I think that is a very interesting uh, outfit to set up. So this kind of Melanie's idea. Other than that, Melanie is a doctor which uh, vouches for good quality. My doctor, myself, can really, if you talk to a doctor, they, these are the serious people in the room. Absolutely. And uh, she's going to talk about special use of chatbots in their penetration testing work. Please welcome Melanie Rebaud. Hello there. So uh, I'm going to talk to you today about ten pen testing chat ops. But first, I'd like, just like to give you a little bit of context on myself and also on radically open security. So as uh, Christian just mentioned, we are the world's first not-for-profit computer security consultancy company. I'm sure all of you are universally thinking, huh? What, you know, what, what exactly does that mean, not-for-profit? What it means is that we give, uh, we, well, we are registered as something called a fiscal fundraising institution. Fiscal fondswervende instelling in Dutch. This is a archaic construction from the Dutch church. So churches sometimes want to do a commercial spin-off. They're going to raise some money, you know, sell a few brownies or do whatever they do. And then they want that money to go back to the church with a tax benefit. Now, a famous example of this in the Netherlands is a language institute called Regina Chaley, otherwise known as the Nuns of Fucht, which uh, is the language institute that helped to educate, actually, our queen. Our, uh, she's, she's Argentinian, but she learned how to speak Dutch at this language institute. Now, the way that it worked is the nuns started the language institute, the profits go back to the nuns. Now, as most of you know in being pen testers, uh, we are in an industry that sometimes does questionable things. Right? Uh, you know, it can be working with intelligence agencies, it can be selling monitoring black boxes to developing nations, it can be hacking, hacking activists because Greenpeace is so scary. <laughs> but in the Netherlands, uh, about well, six years ago, I was working in the cybercrime team at ING Bank. We were in the middle of a large DDoS incident. Our servers were down, and we were getting political cartoons <laughs> from the local journalists. And, uh, you know, the C-suite was in the war room. You know, <laughs> the, all, the firewall engineers were busy trying to mitigate all the damage. So this consultant, you know, from a security consultancy company kind of like parachutes in and they're like, yes, you know, I am from such and such company and stand back. I will fix everything for you. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm Melanie and I'm in the cybercrime team at the bank and it's my job to make our security posture better. So if you guys are so leet, then I could probably learn a whole lot from you. So can I please watch what you're doing? Well, they didn't really like that and they were like, Security is hard. And I was like, okay. You know, I used to be an assistant professor of computer science at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam, <laughs> specialized in computer security. Why don't you try me? Yeah. So they threw away bash history logs. They worked in screen and forgot to turn on logging uh, after I reminded them 10 times to do so. And they finally sold us this black box with analysis tools. So as soon as I wanted to actually log into the box to use these tools, they said, we're sorry. We cannot give you the password because it contains our proprietary tools. At which point, I just looked at them and I was like, WTF did we just buy? 
So, you know, this was the arrogance <laughs> of the security consultancy on industry that I was dealing with in the Netherlands. <laughs> also around the same time uh, was, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the hacker camps. We have one ev once every four years in the Netherlands. Uh, of course, I'm sure you know the, the CCC <laughs> and, uh, of course, Congress, but they also have camp once every two years. Uh, there's EMF camp every uh, fourth year, then in the England, and uh, the other year we have a camp in the Netherlands. Well, there was this camp called OM, and uh, basically the German Chaos Computer Congress and the Dutch hacker community boycotted this conference because our market leader, Fox IT, was the main sponsor of the conference. Yeah, so ultimately, you know, the way things went down, their golf carts were stolen, their tent was spray painted, you know, and ultimately there was this organization called Noisy Square that was created in Ohm, uh, which was dedicated to discussing ethics and, uh, you know, openness and transparency and actually bringing hacker values into the hacker, into the security industry. Now, it was clear for me at that time, you know, customers are unhappy, you know? <laughs> we don't like being treated, you know, <laughs> like we're, you know, we don't like it if a dependence is cultivated <laughs> and if we're just given these black boxes. And at the same time, the hacker community also was not happy for working these, with these kinds of organizations with such a lack of ideals. This is the point in time at which I stepped away from the bank and said, you know what, I think there's a hole in the market. This is the reason why I'm going to start Radically Open Security. But I wanted to make it different, and I wasn't entirely sure how. So I went to my friend, Michiel Lenars from the NLNet Foundation, and asked him, you know, it's one thing to say you're different, it's a whole other thing to actually be different. And that was when he said, you know, there's this really elegant construction from the Dutch church. Yeah? The idea of a nonprofit security company gripped me, <laughs> you know, and I wouldn't let it go. And in the last five and a half years, I developed this new kind of social enterprise, you know, which radically open security is. Because we don't have a profit motive, because all of our profit goes to charity, <laughs> it means that every operational decision that we make, you know, is, is focused towards optimizing, not for profit, but for positive impact. Yeah? It is in the context of this in which I now want to get to our technical <laughs> you know, systems that we've developed. But the, the core focus of our company is openness, transparency, and open source. So this brings us now to chat ops. Who here actually knows what chat ops is? Raise your hand. Almost nobody, okay. So chat ops is a concept that was pioneered by GitHub, the company. Okay, now GitHub is a distributed company. I believe they might have an office somewhere in the Bay Area, but they have staff all over the world. Now, Radically Open Security, when we first started, we had a very similar situation. I didn't uh, get an office because it was too expensive and I was bootstrapping. And I, at this point in time, have 40 <laughs> ethical hackers that are all over the place. So there is a critical mass in the Netherlands, but we've got a lot of Germans, a lot throughout Western Europe, uh, but also South Africa, Latin America, Australia, a few in India. So we really have a global workforce, okay? Now, GitHub, you know, I saw a presentation from them a few years ago at the DevOps days in Amsterdam. And uh, what they were doing is they showed how they can make use of a chatbot See, this chatbot was called Hubot, and it's open source software. And they uh, showed how you could use this chatbot to almost like a, a Unix command line. And you could basically put commands into the bot, and then it would, you know, in the back end, execute that command, and then give you the output of that command in that chat room. So, you know, they, for example, would give a command, Hubot, spin up a new server. You know, it would think about it, and then it says, okay, new server started, here's all the identifying information of the new instance. You know, other things like monitor uptime, same thing, you know. Now, the brilliant thing about chat ops is it enables you to intersperse human dialogue with doing, getting actual work done, <laughs> you know, with actually conducting com uh, commands and then getting output back. Now, this is super handy 
for coordinated distributed teams. <laughs> You know, and when I first started Radically Open Security, I mean, we were a distributed team already, but I knew that it could be done because look at how the majority of capture the flag teams work. <laughs> you know, at the beginning, I sort of started with, uh, you know, the typical uh, IRC and Etherpad. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but at a certain point, uh, I saw this chat apps and it was like, it was like the heavens parted. And I said, oh my God, this would be so amazing for security. So. I ran home and asked my system administrator to install Rocket Chat. So Rocket Chat is essentially a open source, self-hosted version of Slack. Who here uses Slack? Okay. Who here, here uses uh, one of the open source Slack variants? Oh my gosh, almost nobody. Okay, well, Slack has a really handy distributed chat environment. It's basically a bit like old school IRC, except it's a whole lot more multimedia friendly. It's pretty easy for, uh, you know, even normal, like, you know, normal people, <laughs> yeah, lay people uh, to use. So, um, we, you know, after we had Rocket Chat installed, we then also installed Hubot. And at that point in time, we were able to start uh, you know, having commands. So for example, uh, if I go back to the back, the last slide, you can see this command here that I type in, and it's, I go raw spot pug me, and then it spits out this picture of a pug. Now, of course, this is completely useless. <laughs> well, culture is important. But of course, we can do far more useful things than this. Here's something that's a bit more useful. So pen test documentation. You know, this is the bane of every pen tester. You know, nobody likes creating quotations. Nobody likes writing pen test reports. So like every other pen testing company in the universe, <laughs> we automated this. Uh, and we have created an XML-based system called Pentext that we open sourced and also eventually made an OWASP project. But that aside, uh, you can see how we invoke it using the chatbot. So I use this command, raw spot, quick scope, uh, OFF, that means uh, it's for oferta, which is basically Dutch for quotation, and then Melanie demo. When this ha what, what this does is it takes an A4's worth of XML and then basically turns it into a long form XML that contains all the standard boilerplate that would go into a typical quotation. Basically, we've automated all of this away because, you know, like most, like, like Larry Wall says, you know, programmers should be lazy. So, I mean, anything we have to do more than once, you know, we, we've automated away by now. So, uh, it expands uh, to include the boilerplate along with the X, X, A4's worth of content. At that point, uh, you can see how it actually is invoking the backend tool chain. So, it's uh, call, calling this builder tool that we wrote. It's basically then using uh, Saxon and also XS. LT style sheets. It's compiling that PDF. You can see that it's automatically password protecting that PDF. By the way, yes, we're reevaluating re uh, re this for the new uh, exploit that just came out. Uh, but anyway, and what it does is it spits out a clickable link. So what that means is anybody who is in the chat room can then click on that link. That basically goes to our GitLab instance uh, that's internal. So anyone who then has access to that particular GitLab repository can then view the PDF that we just created. <laughs> so one person can type the command, the entire team can see the output and benefit from that. So, you know, again, believe it or not, we actually wrote documentation for our system. I, meant, I mentioned already that it's an OWASP project. Check it out. Uh, and you can see that this is typically what the expanded XML would look like, and this is roughly what comes out of it. So it looks like a standard pen test report that you, like, like you would see from pretty much anyone. Uh, again, it's open source. Feel free to replace your own logo, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and your house style and use it yourself. So, you know, at that point, uh, if you look in the back end, if you did want to tweak anything, uh, this is what the structure would look like. But what's actually more interesting is the fact that we also have a conversion script that uses GitLab issues. So basically, a pen tester can actually put into a GitLab issue the written description, 
you know, of uh, the lead or the finding or the non-finding. We also have non-findings, which means we report the things we tried that did not work. And then they run the conversion script, and that gets then converted into this XML. So actually, for the most part, the pen testers don't even need to deal with the XML unless there's some really tiny fiddly thing that needs to be changed. So that's one example of something that we can invoke from the chatbot as a command line. But it doesn't stop there. There's a lot more possibilities for what we can uh, invoke from the chat. Another tool that we wrote was the passive vulnerability scanning tool. So what we did is we uh, correlated the output from Shodan and also from Census, basically, so we could do passive uh, reconnaissance on a particular, uh, uh, well, basically, uh, site. And then what we can do is, again, invoke this from the chat <laughs> and then get the report, uh, basically, you know, the output comes into the uh, chat room, and then if there's long lists, that also automatically gets uh, checked into GitLab, where you then can click on a link and then automatically go to that. So it's actually a super you, you know, efficient workflow, and you can use this for so many other kinds of tools. Things like running scans, like say Nmap, you know, or web scanners like W3AF, <laughs> you know, or uh, other kinds of tools, you know, you can basically have it so that the scan output goes directly into GitLab, the chatbot then at that point spits out this nice clickable link, and then, you know, it makes the workflow super fast and super efficient. So, but there's another little thing that we do that's a bit different from other security companies. So I told you about that story from when I was at that at the bank, and I had that incident where I wanted to watch with the security company. Now, ultimately in that story, how I finally saw what that company was doing is I physically stood next to them and I looked over their shoulder, you know, because that was the one way they couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> so, you know, that was the inspiration for the workflow that we call peek over our shoulder. So what this means is we take our customers and we add them into our chat rooms. And remember, we're a distributed company. I've got hackers all over the place. We have no office. So they are watching you know, and listening to every single conversation that my hackers are having <laughs> you know, while we are busy breaking their stuff. It's awesome. Yeah? It optimizes for knowledge transfer from us to them. But even better, the customer is an oracle, right? So it's super useful for us, and it prevents us from wasting time on a lot of really stupid things. You know, if something breaks, you know, the developers of that software are in the room to help us fix it, you know? <laughs> if we need a server rebooted, if we want to ask, hey, what does that function do? Or why is this code path like this? Or are you using a strong password here? Or why did you make this design decision? We can ask, and we get really tight feedback. You know, and this makes us super efficient. I think actually that we can probably get two to three times as far in our pen tests precisely because of that tight feedback loop. The other nice thing also about uh, having customers in your chat room is also it enables us to do things like red blue pen testing. So what we did is we gamified their pen test, okay? So we can take the developers, sysadmins, DevOps people, and let's say we can take a, a dozen of them. We can divide them into two teams. It can either be a red team and a red team, or a red team and a blue team. What we then can do is we can have them compete at hacking their own system under guidance of, one of, of basically one of our professional pen testers per team. So they step out of their role as developer you know, for basically two days to a week and just literally compete, we gamify it. The number one comment that we get after red-blue pen testing exercises is, and I quote, I will never look at code the same way again. And this is why we do it. So you can see that I'm calling this command. You can see it, I, uh, I type in good job blue. And then Rossbot, which is the name of our bot, uh, says incremented blue, 24 points, and then it prints out a motivational image. You know, so we have built this scoreboard app 
into our chatbot, <laughs> you know? So uh, this, you know, in such a way, you know, being what, what initially seems like a disadvantage to people, not being physically co-located in an office, suddenly becomes this tremendously huge advantage. <laughs> You know, because it's only because of our open and transparent workflow and our use of a chatbot that we can even do things like this to be able to create this kind of red-blue pen testing experience. But it turns out there's actually more that we can do. In fact, a lot more. So I already mentioned scanning tools like uh, Nmap, W3AF. You know, what else can we automate to put behind the chatbot? You know, SQL map, maybe? How about password crackers? You know, it gets better than that. We have rainbow tables, right? You know, and I can basically, using the web interface on my phone, I can log in, you know, and I can crack your password using, you know, rainbow tables from my cell phone. How cool is that? <laughs> you know? And you can basically do this with any web-enabled device that, where you can get through to multiple layers of auth that are needed. So, of course, uh, I have to mention off on this. <laughs> My customers, they're sometimes a bit naughty. The first thing that some of them do once we let them into our chat rooms is they try to hack, it, hack us. I say good for them. If they can manage it, I'm happy, willing to give them a discount. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. But, uh, of course, we need to also think about the security of such things because, uh, like any software, there's also obvious security implications of having customers in your chat rooms and keeping data separated, et cetera. So uh, we also are pen testing this software regularly and are also in the middle of a giant DevOps refactoring in which we can put individual customers' stuff in separate containers. So uh, we're not entirely finished <laughs> you know, refactoring as much as we want, but it's moving in that direction. So, you know. Anyway, but uh, other things you can do with your chatbot, other things you can sort of centralize, uh, things like recon. So do you want to use Google? Do you want to use uh, Whois? Do you want to use let me duck, duck go that for you? No. Um, you know, the passive scanning tool, for example. Other there's other kinds of things you can also invoke from the chatbot. So for example, we built this phishing suite. Uh, and I also open sourced it, by the way. And what it is, is we can invite security officers into the chat room. And then as they provide us with a list of phishing targets, and essentially the instrumented links then connect to our web server, which then uses the, I'm sorry, the mail server, which then connects to the, uses the Slack API so that every time one of the phishing targets clicks on a link, the chatbot spits out a message that says, this email address just clicked on this pretext name at this timestamp. So the security officers can literally sit there and watch their own employees getting phished. You know, sometimes it's super entertaining. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've also have uh, instrumented forms uh, that work in exactly the same way. You know, and at one point in time, we uh, we're phishing a developer, at a, uh, I'm sorry, a hosting company. At a certain point, a developer noticed that, you know, the domain didn't look quite as kosher as uh, it should have been. So he started playing with the form. So we started seeing, you know, like, you know, username, hello, password, you know, something else. Username, woohoo, password, SQL injection. That was cute. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> but, you know, that, of course, also leads to questions such as, was he doing this from a sandboxed environment? <laughs> but anyhow, but at a certain point, yeah, the security officers were like, okay, we're going to lunch now, but thank you, that was really entertaining. <laughs> so, but, you know, it also really visualizes the situation. We also have done phishing uh, tests on healthcare institutions that were commissioned by, uh, how do I say, sort of like umbrella organizations of Dutch healthcare institutions in the, ne in the Netherlands. And we've uh, done these attacks on 30 different healthcare institutions uh, at the same time, including some large ones. And with this particular chat ops, the phishing, like the clicks were coming in so fast that it rendered the chat room useless, <laughs> literally. I mean, we had to create a brand new chat room, <laughs> you know, just to actually have conversation about what was going on. But, you know, this is really interesting, and it provides a new way of being able to get <laughs> information on what's going on. 
One consequence that it also has, though, is it really starts to make your development process uh, become, as I would call, production. You know? Because if at radically open security, if our infrastructure goes down, the whole company goes down. You know? So this essentially t does have the effect of turning your security company, your pen testing company, into a DevOps company, basically. Which basically means that you also need dedicated IT people, you know, and, and we're also constantly developing this, constantly refactoring it. But again, the good news is we're, we are doing this big DevOps refactoring. We have Dockerized uh, already large parts of this, you know, for easy spin up for other people. And did I mention we open sourced everything and it's an OWASP project. So, you know, you can all, we also use uh, chat ops for project management. So things like uh, Kanban, you know, like every other company in the world that does a lot of stuff, we need to, to manage our projects. We use uh, Kanboard for that. Uh, we also have our own uh, uh, kind of like Zendesk, like support desk system that we built in which you can have instrumented uh, email addresses that then uh, when uh, e well, basically, when emails are sent and these sort of magic email addresses are included, then the mail server, want, you know, basically can say, this email was just sent, you know, to th th this set of people. Here's the subject line. Click here to read a copy of it in GitLabs. So you can actually track email correspondence per project. And what we then do is if we do multiple jobs for a single customer, of which we oftentimes do, you can just add the security officers automatically to all of the, the, you know, the channels related to their projects, and they are automatically looped in without any extra effort, <laughs> you know, as long as these sort of magic email addresses are consistently used. So, you know, again, really powerful, efficient stuff that suddenly becomes possible when you start using chat ops. So, uh, charge. You know, we, we're a consultancy company, and time is money, you know? <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, if there's another thing be besides documentation that pen, tests, pen testers hate, uh, they also hate uh, declaring their hours. <laughs> but we made it easy. You can just go raw spot, charge, the number of hours, and then the description of what you just did. Okay? And then raw spot says, thank you, name of pen tester. You just declared n hours on, you know, this uh, description. You now have, you know, m hours left of the pen, te pen test with a total of r hours. And then it shows this uh, progress bar. So, you know, <laughs> it, that much information which lets the pen testers know at every single charge how much time they have left. But even more importantly, the customers can see where their time for their assignment is going. You know, and when time is money, they care about this. So this is further, you know, really making exactly what we spend time on be as open and transparent as possible. You know, there's a lot more things that we can do. I don't have time to talk about all of it now. We use role-based access control that uh, is consistent uh, throughout our entire infrastructure. We also can do things like error logging and debug logging in separate chat rooms. This is great because it means that our techies, you know, our system administrators can actually debug things without getting a shell on servers. Like, win, you know, like total win. So, you know, other things, we, there's a lot of different commands. So things like help menus, you know, we've kind of built a man style help menu to help uh, manage the different commands. You know, and what could you do in the future? You know, I mean, this is sort of an open research question. Could you, you know, use AI to build AI chatbots? I mean, sorry for, for getting buzzwordy here, but the point that I'm making is, you know, you very well could teach chatbots how to do things like, I don't know, do customer satisfaction surveys. I mean, of course, everybody hates those, right? You get them in the mail and you just throw it away. At least I do. But the point is, if the chatbot were to, you know, ask a customer at, towards the end of the assignment, how do you think we did? If the customer gives a surprising answer, guess what? There's humans in there. So it's the way of be, being able to, to combine the consistency and methodicalness and routine of something automated with the human touch, you know, that only humans can provide. So anyway, food for thought. So we have won quite a few awards 
for both our uh, business model and also for our open and transparent workflow. Radically Open Security, after five and a half years, now has 40 staff members, has had over 80 customers, including Google, Mozilla, the Open Tech Fund in the United States, but also banks, you know, insurance companies, hosting providers, telcos, software companies, but also we do work at cost price for nonprofits, NGOs, and civil society. So we have a Robin Hood kind of pricing model. You know, the big guys pay the, the top price, and then our, uh, you know, we can't give away the services completely for free because I still have to pay my hackers, but, you know, cost price, uh, especially for some of our junior hackers, can already do a considerable amount for civil society organizations who have some of the scariest threat models, literally, and almost no budget. So the Dutch Chamber of Commerce called Radically Open Security one of the 50th most innovative SMEs in the Netherlands. CIO Magazine called me the most innovative IT leader of the, ne the Netherlands. And also, more recently, the European Commission called me one of the nine most innovative women in the European Union. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Which is kind of funny, because I'm American, but never mind. <laughs> um, but the point is that it's not about me. It's about our ideas. It's about bringing openness and transparency, and, you know, and optimization for open source into the security industry and into the pen testing process, because this is so desperately needed. And it's also about uh, nonprofit business, what I call post-growth business. I do not have time to talk about this today, but what I can say is back in June, I just gave a talk at TEDx Berlin. So if you Google my name, you know, Melanie Ryback, TEDx Berlin, you can get uh, an 18-minute video that describes my business model. If you also want more information on that, you can go to postgrowthentrepreneurship.com. For the rest, I really hope that you have found this talk to be useful, hopefully a bit inspirational, and remember, our tools are open source. So if you want a similar workflow for your own company, steal our tools, please, and I would be, oops, uh, I would be happy to help you. So thank you very much. We're running a wee bit late on time, but we're taking a single question from the audience. Who volunteers? You blew them away. <laughs> All right. Okay. If there is no question, actually, we've went to great lengths to actually bring somebody from that unnamed Dutch security company in the room. Evud, uh, would you like to respond to these claims? <laughs> Take the mic. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Melanie. You remember me probably. <laughs> So I was one of the, 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 the unfortunate whose golf cart got stolen <laughs> while we were there <laughs> yeah. with the big, big ambulance. Um, um, oh. Yeah, it, uh, it, it wasn't nice of the hackers to do that. Uh. <laughs> but um, I wish you all the luck with your uh, open, um, open style of, of work and communication, and I'm sure to check out your tools. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> Wonderful.